The following podcast was recorded on Thursday, August 12th, 2021, featuring Ben Breitholtz of Arbor Data Science. To hear the podcast in real time, you can sign up for a free trial at arborresearch.com or by emailing Gus Handler directly at gus.handler at arborresearch.com. You can also call Arbor Research and Trading at 1-800-606-1872. Thanks for your time and enjoy the podcast. Welcome everyone to our latest edition of Talking Data. I'm your host, Kristen Radish of Arbor Research and Trading, joined today by Ben Breitholtz of Arbor Data Science. Today, Ben, let's get into a quick inflation update. And then if you could walk us through the everything rally that's been going on. So yesterday, the CPI report was released. And today we had core PPI at 1% versus 0.5% forecast and at 7.8% on a yearly basis. What are all these leading inflation indicators telling us? So yeah, it, it, the the sad thing for investors is that there's no doubt the you know the team transitory versus t, team persistence that that battle is still going on. I think there's some victory laps potentially being taken by team transitory on the CPI report. We did see a peak um, in the year over year figures, and a lot of the three month annualized figures have also rolled over, which is fitting with all of the different surveys from prices paid to supplier delivery times to trucking flatbed rates all rolling over between May and July. So the story there is that it seems like, you know, uh, CPI, consumer inflation is rolling over. Now, PPI on the producer side uh, has, you know, had a pretty good size beat, 50 basis points, as you just said. So that was a bit of a shocker. Uh, markets seem to take that very much in stride, like they always do with PPI. It's kind of a um, and not a, as heavily watched report. Uh, there were some very strange idiosyncratic bursts in there, um, uh, you know, goosing that year over year number, strange things like haircuts and um, as well as um, uh, some of pet services and so on. Um, but um, at, you know, at its core, if you look at the commodities that make up PPI, there is a little bit of ubiquity there. Um, so we were just showing a chart where 88% uh, of commodities within the PPI report were rebounding on a three-month annualized basis or railing. Uh, that's quite a ubiquitous uh, jump. That's something that historically has typically been, un been unsustainable um, and somewhat of an extreme. So we'll see if that comes off the boil. Uh, but more importantly, there's a pretty good size skew, you know, right side skew now to PPI. So if you look at all these different commodities, there's, you know, there's hundreds of them within the report and look at the three-month annualized growth and their Z scores, um, you know, what percentage are producing, you know, two plus uh, standard deviation shocks or rises in that three-month annualized rate. And that's jumped all the way up to 44%, really the most since I believe 1979. And I hate trying to focus on the 1970s because uh, that's such a different period with inflation. That's where all the inflation needs to seem to go. Uh, but this is kind of akin to that period a, a large right side tail is being seen in commodities and the hope is there that will abate um the unfortunate thing is we got some more news um, out of China that we're going to have some port close. We have another port closure. 25% of the capacity at the Ningbo port uh, is, is closed down due to a COVID case. Uh, we'll see if there's more cases and if that it continues to be the, uh, to be the case. Um, what's interesting is you look at the marine traffic in and around the Ningbo port, there's now a sizable number of anchored ships that need to get into port. Uh, that's going to be a problem. You could, you could Look back to late May with the Yantian port closure, which was a big disruptor, helped goose higher those cargo shipping rates. You know, now we're well above twelve thousand dollars per forty foot box uh, to get from Shanghai to the U.S. and to portions of Europe. Um, so this this PPI inflation, um, you know, it's possible due to the difficulty of moving stuff around uh, could allow that inflation to persist a little bit longer than expected. But again, looking back at all these indicators, it says that this should be kind of a, a blow off point. Um, and we'll see if that's the case, uh, you know, when we get towards year end. But the bottom line is, uh, there is no clear decisive winner yet in, in team transitory versus persistence. This story is going to go on for a while. So next, we want to talk about what you've classified as the everything rally. Asset classes that produce similar positive risk adjusted returns have had this cycle since around March of this year. Um, what, where are we headed next? 
So this is what is I think was is is pretty wild is the we have sharp ratios, which again are just risk adjusted returns. It's the return given the risk taken, you know, over the standard deviation of those uh, returns. And here we're looking at it 100 uh, kind of a rolling 100 trading day basis. And the they're all huddled together. They're all positive. And so it's kind of been what we can call an everything rally. Um, now it gets a little bit concerning because typically when you get such a strong connection um, between sharp ratios and risk adjusted returns and also very tight dispersion, typically that means we're getting close to the exhaust and a release point and should see higher dispersion. If you look back to this chart, it shows you the max minus min sharp ratio across a whole host of assets, everything from safe assets like treasuries on out to the S&P 500 and also some commodities. And you'll note that typically when we get to this level, um, a sharp ratio spread below two from the max to the min, uh, it's fleeting and we do see mean reversion, meaning higher dispersion, uh, typically over the months and quarters to follow. And we, we've got a chart next on the variance between the major asset classes. Can you walk us through this? So the, the big thing that typically happens when we get these kind of, you know, everything rallies or sell-offs or, you know, again, some higher correlations, which is going to be measured here, is there's usually some kind of latent factor uh, behind everything. It, and it can be it can be multiple latent factors. It could be it could be Fed QE, it could be the stimulus now and so on. Uh, but what we've been able to do here is isolate the variance explained not to get too heady, this is using principal components analysis. So think of it just like a correlation. So how much are these assets, everything again from agriculture to REITs to the S&P 500, how much are their returns on a rolling 100 trading day basis related? And in orange shows us periods when they are highly related. And uh, throughout the pandemic, no surprise given the stimulus and also the pandemic kind of uh, taking over the entire world, um, uh, there was a lot of control and consistency in return or connection in return asset class returns throughout that period. But also then historically, we have some comparisons like Brexit, uh, the UN deval, the taper tantrum, and uh, that kind of is akin to the scenarios we're going through right now with a Delta variant, um, now the Ningbo foreclosure, um, and that's caused a kind of a higher degree of connection again across asset class returns. Um, and we'll see how long this can last. Again, typically not a, a condition that can persist for too long. And another thing we expect to happen, not just dispersion in returns, but also a relaxing in the correlation of these returns, uh, be it positive or negative uh, going forward. Let's take a look next at total returns. Should we expect a diverse, ex diverse returns and volatility across asset classes? Yeah, so if you look back historically at these periods when we've gotten this, you know, ultra tight dispersion, and that's any time the spread between the maximum and minimum sharp ratio uh, fell below two. And that's what we're querying for all, about, all the way back to 1990. Um, what we're going to focus in on here is really the post crisis period. So from 2011 to 2021, which is in the bottom chart. And historically, long bonds tend to outperform um, uh, from that point, which is something we've kind of started to see um, a little bit um, with, you know, with the kind of the rally we've seen since maybe mid-March or late March or so uh, in treasuries. But on the flip side, stocks, uh, especially globally, tend to suffer. Uh, the MSCI world XUS index is on average or really on median seeing a pullback of around 10%. The S&P 500 somewhere around 4% within that first, you know, 4 to 5 months following ultra tight disper uh, ultra tight yeah dispersion um, across asset classes. So I the the thing that I'm looking forward to isn't necessarily, you know, a market crash or a pullback, uh, but I think more uh, disrupted markets and greater variance in returns, it's hard to say that the long bond is going to perform like it did historically, you know, typically through the first three months after these ultra tight periods of dispersion, uh, the long bonds, you know, produce a, a big return of 10% on median. That's possible, but uh, not exactly as likely. What I'm just more focused on, again, is that the dispersion does show up um, and does erupt some point around three months after these periods of ultra tight dispersion across all major asset classes. And next we have a chart on the S&P 500 and the long-term uh, US treasuries. 
So yeah, it, it, an oddity uh, really is since early April has been that the long bond being US treasuries has performed uh, almost identical to the S&P 500. So they've both, both returned somewhere around 10%. Um, the strange thing is that they are um, now the most negatively correlated that they've been really since maybe uh, September or so of last year. So they they are acting as a counterbalance to each other. They are acting as a hedge, but they you know, they're producing the same same return. So here, what I did is I created a nice little index. Is if you were 100% long the S&P 500 uh, versus 100% short long-term U.S. Treasuries, and what I've highlighted in yellow is that it's just gone sideways so they've essentially been producing the same return despite um, negative correlation so this is something we think is that is again unsustainable um, and is likely going to um, fall away and unfortunately uh, for risk asset investors likely mean that risk asset returns need to be tempered and we'll talk about that here in these next slides as to why okay we'll go on to our next slide and this is again uh, just S&P 500 outperforms long-term treasury seven months after central bank shadow rates rebound. So what we're doing here is we are now comparing this, um, the return uh, kind of differential between stocks and bonds. So again, it's saying if I was 100% long stocks versus 100% short bonds, um, here would be my rolling one-year return, and that's in blue. Uh, then in orange, what we have is the central bank shadow rates for all the biggies, everyone from the Bank of Japan, uh, the Reserve Bank of Australia, the Fed, ECB, and so on. And that is looked at on a one-year rolling basis. So how tight or easy is policy becoming? And we like shadow rates because it incorporates QE and the, really the open market purchases. So we get a, a real flavor for um, you know what central banks are doing and how they're shifting. Over the past few months, we've seen this super easy policy begun to wane and shadow rates um, on average are beginning to rise. Now with the US and the Fed looking to taper, that makes sense. We're seeing similar things out of Australia and Canada and so on. It seems like the ball's just starting to get rolling. So that's something that could persist. Um, but what's really fascinating is that if you look at the bottoming in easy policy from central banks, so the bottoming in that year over year change in shadow rates, and look seven months later from that point, almost always the S&P 500 ends, if you go back to that previous chart, almost always the S&P 500 begins to underperform or at least pull back relative to long bonds. So that blue line during or just after those gray areas, which are those seven month periods, you can see that the equity market begins to truly slow down, the bond market picks up speed or at least is uh, performing as well, if not better uh, over those months to come. So in the next chart, we showed that typical path by all these different assets. And so the S&P 500, uh, this is again from the seven months from the bottoming in central bank shadow rates, what happens trading days later. In this case, this is gonna be uh, over the next year. And S&P 500 in red, on, on median grinds sideways uh, and actually you know suffers some very minor drawdowns and that really persists over the six that next six months um, on the flip side bonds the long end of the curve tends to perform very very well and uh, produces again like we see 10 percent plus returns over those you know the next you know six month period um, which in contrast to the s&p 100 is quite a gap now again it's gonna be, it'd be surprising to see long bonds perform like this. I think the big takeaway is that the S&P 500 and risk assets in general tend to see their um, you know, momentum slow. So as economies are rebounding and central banks start to take notice and tighten policy, it's a delayed impact uh, on the equity market. And you know, as we all know, as the Fed and other central banks typically begin to start hiking rates, or in this case, tapering, the stock market does quite well. Um, and it's just a matter of when they get to that point that it's starting to get fully priced in, that there's a shift occurring globally in central bank policy toward uh, tighter policy, if that delayed impact that we see that shows up here in this chart with the S&P 500 kind of grinding sideways. So with economic momentum slowing, how concerned should investors and policymakers be? 
Uh, I don't think much. You know, the, the nice thing is there's the consumer and the consumer balance sheet still in a good place. Uh, yes, they may be dipping into savings for the first time um, in a while, uh, but a lot of the alternative data is supporting continued spending. We also have high degree of mobility, especially around retail and kind of recreation locations, uh, really across the globe. That has yet to abate uh, in the face of the Delta variant. Uh, the only thing that uh, that I've, I've noted as of late is in the next chart is that the uh, skew that we've been enjoying really for the past year in economic data releases globally, uh, that positive skew has now uh, disappeared. So what we show in this top chart here is stacked the skew by economic data release. And this is everything from confidence to retail spending. And again, this is a global level. And so every time we do get a, a release, our data picks up on it. We measure it relative to one year average growth rates. And so we, are we better or worse than those average uh, one year average growth rates? And then we're taking the skew in that data. And so you can see since the pandemic hit and we came out of it in you know, July or August, we had this overwhelming positive skew across all, essentially all economic data series. That is now over the past just three or four weeks come to an end. And so that is uh, you know, a tailwind that was behind equity markets and risk assets that I think will fade and does suggest that more meager returns are likely here moving forward, uh, barring you know, major stimulus, again, on the fiscal uh, or monetary side from, from central banks. So we'll have to watch this closely. The most the more important part is what are those actual economic data changes doing, not just the skew. And yes, they're retreating as they should from the breakneck speed they saw. Um, but as long as those remain above average, uh, I think that we're still in an okay place. But this excessive optimism that we had with this huge positive skew in global econ data, that's something we've just lost uh, for the first time since the pandemic. Well, thank you, Ben, for all of your thoughts today. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. As a reminder, Arbor Research and Trading is an institutional research and brokerage firm. Our two most prominent offerings are Bianca Research and Arbor Data Science. For any questions or further information, you can contact Gus Handler at gus.handler at arborresearch.com. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.